Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you that are guests, my name is George Acevedo. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad you're here. A few weeks, or a few days ago, Cheryl and I uh, decided to take a few vacation days together, and we went to Orlando uh, with a few friends here from church. And uh, one of the things we decided to do on one of the days was to go to Universal Studios. Now, for my FPU friends, it came out of the entertainment envelope. Thank you very much, all right? And so uh, uh, we, we paid with cash or whatever. So uh, we went to Universal Studios, and it's been a while since Cheryl and I have been there. And uh, some things always are changing at these theme parks. And the thing that had changed the most since we were there last was the whole Harry Potter explosion. And everywhere we went in Universal Studios or Island of, Islands of Adventure, it was Harry Potter this and Harry Potter that. But there's only one problem. Uh, Cheryl and I have not read any of the seven books or seen any of the eight movies, right? Like we're like the last people in the universe, right? So we're walking around Universal and Islands of Adventure, and we're seeing full-grown adults in their right mind in October in Florida, wearing wool things, wool capes, and little magic wands running around and, you know, doing little things, and drinking this stuff called butter beer, which I'm not so sure in recovery where I can drink that stuff. But, so we, we're walking around Universal Studios, and there's talking frogs, there's these little trolls, there's all this stuff, trains, and I understand nothing. Zero. Nada. The truth is that if I had seen the movie or read the book, I'd understand the point of the wizarding world of Harry Potter, but I don't. And Jesus understood this. Jesus understood that when he told stories, part of the point was that people would get the point, that people would understand the story. Because story has within it the capacity to move us, to move the mind, the heart, and the will. And here's what Jesus understood better than anyone. Jesus understood that when he told story, behind that story was spiritual truth and power. What Pastor West talked about, power. Behind the story was the power of God to change a life, a family, a community, and yes, even the entire world. And that's why Jesus, seven times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four biographies of Jesus that we call the Gospels, that's why seven times Jesus used the exact same phrase about getting the point of his stories. We looked at it the first week. Let's look at it again. From Matthew chapter 13, verse 9, let's read this together. Ready, go. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Now, I want you to circle three words in this small little verse. Circle the word hear, listen, and understand. Now, we know that hearing is a function of our auditory system, and if we're blessed with relatively good hearing, we can hear noise, and it'll get transmitted through the brain, and, and, and we'll actually hear but we know that you can hear and not listen. Just ask my wife. She's on the front row. You can hear and not listen. Can the brothers say amen, all right? <laughs> okay. See, we can hear and listen. Jesus didn't want us just to have the auditory thing. He doesn't want us just to listen. Jesus wants us to get the point. That's what understand is all about. That's what wasn't happening for me at Universal Studio this past week. I didn't understand. And so Jesus tells some 50 to 70 stories in the four Gospels that we call parables, stories. He wants us to get the truth. He wants us to get the understanding because Jesus knows, again, behind the story is truth that can change our lives. And that's why when Jesus was teaching in the first century in Palestine in Israel, he used images and metaphors, illustrations, if you will, that common ordinary first century people would get. So Jesus would talk about wheat and weeds. 
He'd talk about vineyards and vineyard keepers. He'd talk about sheep and shepherds because Jesus understood that those common agricultural people understood those common kinds of illustrations because they were living it. So that if Jesus were to teach today, he would talk about the internet and cable TV and the things that we understand because Jesus wants us to get the point. Now, here's the truth. There were people in the audience that Jesus was speaking to 2,000 years ago that when they listened to Jesus and they heard the truth, it confronted who they were and they weren't happy about it. Isn't it true that when you read the Bible, there are still times that Jesus confronts you on your stuff and you're not happy about it? That when he starts messing with my selfishness, with my self-centeredness, with my ego, when he starts messing with my greed, when he starts messing with my lack of compassion, he confronts me. There was a, a group that Jesus seemed to recreationally get under their skin. They were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Now what you need to understand about the first century in Palestine is that the Romans were the governmental officials. They were in charge. But just underneath them were a group of religious leaders that had been given authority by the Romans to kind of keep things in control. And in Jesus' day, guess what they had? Two parties. Hmm, Sounds vaguely familiar, right? A conservative party and a liberal party, the reds and the blues, right? And and the conservative party was known as the Pharisees. They were the kind of the ruling religious group of the day. And Jesus loved to get underneath their skin. Jesus loved to mess with them. And he messed with them because their message contradicted Jesus' message. Remember who Jesus hung out with? Who did Jesus hung out with? Well, he hung out with drunks, the Bible tells us, prostitutes, tax collectors, and then the Bible uses this phrase, other notorious sinners. That would include you and me. This is who Jesus hung out with. And so when the ruling religious leaders, the Pharisees, would see Jesus hanging out with these people, they would judge Jesus as being a drunkard. They would judge Jesus as being with those notorious sinners. But Jesus came to share a message that would set those people free. And what angered Jesus so much about the Pharisees, listen to me, was their nationalism, their desire to control people, and their teachings that kept people under their religious thumb. So we're going to look at a story today in John chapter 10. But unlike the other parables that Wes and Kevin and I have been sharing with you about, this parable is very different. Because in the other parables, Jesus most of the time was talking about this thing called the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But in the teaching we're going to look at today, the focus of Jesus' story is himself. It's himself. Now, to understand this story in John chapter 10, we got to go way back to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, um, Jesus stands in front of the crowd, some of these notorious sinners and some of these Pharisees listening to him. And at the end of the festival of the tabernacles, Jesus stands in the temple and he says, I am the light of of the world. Those who have walked in darkness have now seen a glorious light. Now, what was Jesus doing? He was challenging the Pharisees in their teaching. Because this was a big Jewish festival, and they taught that if you followed the festival to a T, that everything was good between you and God. The problem was, it eliminated most of the people in that community. God wasn't for everybody. He was just for the religious elite. So we get to John chapter 9, and Jesus does this cool Jedi trick. Gets a little bit of dirt, spits in it, makes a mud pie puts it in this blind guy's eyes, tells him to go down to the pool at Salome, which was quite a walk. He goes and washes it out, and he comes back, and he can see. 
Now, what was Jesus' point there? Just like his teaching had a point, Jesus' miracles had a point. And here was the point of his miracle. He was saying to the Pharisees, your teachings, your religious rituals and rules blind people to God. But I've come because I'm the light, and I want to... I want to allow people to see the light of God's glorious love for them. Well, this angered the Pharisees. They're very angry now because he's taught and he's done this miracle. And so Jesus is standing with this same crowd. Remember, the crowd is still there. The group of notorious sinners and religious bigots are still in the room listening to Jesus. And Jesus in John chapter 10 says, listen, don't follow these Pharisees. Instead, follow me. And he's going to make the point of the story is about following him. And here's the question that's burning for us to answer today. Why should I follow Jesus? Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. There are a bunch of us in this room that have been in church a long time, and we can very easily become religious bigots. Very easily. It can become about the rules and the regulations instead of simply following Jesus. Jesus. What it means to be a Christian is to follow Jesus. And so Jesus is going to teach us about who he is and why it's worth us following him. He gives us at least three things that make him worthy of our following him. And here they are. Number one, Jesus gives me the life I crave. He gives me the life I crave. Say life. life. Say life again. Life. Say zoe. zoe. That's a Greek word for life. Jesus is going to use it here in a minute. Now, we tend to think of life as being, do I got a pulse? Yeah, I'm alive, right? The word zoe doesn't mean, do you have a pulse? Let's look at what Jesus says. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. So Jesus spoke again. I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and outlaws. Now, he's talking about the Pharisees here. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Read these last two lines with me. Ready? Go. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy I came so that they could have life. Indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. So Jesus describes himself here as the gate of the sheep. Now, uh, if you've been here for a while, you've heard uh, Pastor Wes or Kevin or I teach about how first century shepherds would, would uh, at the end of the day, would guide their sheep into some kind of a sheep pen, either made out of stone or some kind of natural material, and there would be an opening And that the shepherd would lead them in, and then the shepherd would literally sleep and would become the gate. He was the protection, if you will, from the thieves, the outlaws, who would come to steal the sheep. And so that when Jesus gets to the very end of this verse, John 10, 10, and he says, the thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know what he's talking about? A lot of us have translated this verse to think that Jesus is talking about the evil one. But do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the capacity that following rules and religion has to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have zoe. And Zoe isn't just about a heartbeat. Zoe's about living this soulish, fully alive experience. So much so that Jesus adds at the very end, I don't want you just to have life. I want you to have life so much so that it's overflowing, that it's abundant. So this week I I, I got a phone call from a really good friend of mine. She's one of my three mentors. Uh, Pastor Wes's dad, Bishop Dick Wills, and Barbara Riddle. When Cheryl and I graduated, uh, I was 28, and I went to First United Methodist Church in Kissimmee, Florida. Now, you got to understand, Kissimmee is kind of an old rodeo town that Disney decided to move next to. 
And uh, it's an old cowboy church, West, West. And you, can you imagine what they must have felt like when they got the news that their senior pastor was a woman and their associate was a Puerto Rican, all right? And these are a bunch of country boys, right? They're like, who did we get angry at? You know, so, so we show up, and Barbara and I have this remarkable four years together they're serving. So at the end of four years, the bishop decides he's got a new assignment for Barbara, a new assignment for me, and uh, we leave. So it's been 20, almost 25 years now. And since then, Barbara has retired. Now what you don't know about our friend Barbara is that she's had excruciating back pain and, and multiple, at least a half dozen, surgeries. She's got pins and rods all the way up from the bottom, from the top to the bottom of her back. And so she had to retire early because she can't stand the rigor of being a day-to-day pastor. So I thought Barbara would just kind of go off into a pasture, because that's what pastors do, and they would, she would just go off and just quietly, you know. But I've been creeping her on Facebook for the last couple of years. And my friend Barbara, my mentor, one of Wes's mentors as well, she's a member of a wonderful church in Central Florida. She sings in the choir. She doesn't have to. She just recently went on a mission trip. Her and her husband uh, grow, grow these plants, and then they sell them and give the money away to missions. She's always going to the hospital to visit people. You see, Barbara, Barbara wasn't doing all that stuff simply because she was the pastor or because she was drawing a paycheck. She was doing all that stuff because she's fully alive in Jesus. So what about you? Are you fully alive in Jesus. He says, follow me and I'll make you fully alive. Second thing Jesus says. He says, second reason you should follow me is because I'm going to give you the love that you crave. Jesus gives me the love I crave. Now, our culture has a definition of love. And for the most part, I think our culture's definition of love is wrong. Our our culture's definition of love is that I'm going to find the object of my love, and I'm going to give that person my love, and that person's going to give me back their love, and I'm just going to be satisfied. And it sounds really great, especially in love songs. Uh, Tim Keller, who's the pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, is an amazing scholar, author, writer, speaker. And I was watching a video of Tim Keller where he was talking about our culture's understanding of love. He did this cool thing. He invited the band to do love songs from the 30s up to the present day. He ended with John Legend's uh, All of Me. And then he said this. He said, because we've made the object of our love and an affection, a human being who's frail just like, uh, just like us, that love is never fully satisfying. We've replaced the love that God has for us and that we have for God with a human being, and it'll never satisfy. And there are a lot of us that are looking for love in all the wrong places and looking for love in too many faces. And we think that if we could just find the right partner, then my life is going to be full. And I want you to know that the only one who can fill that craving in your heart is Jesus. Here's how Jesus put it. John chapter 10, verses 11 through 13, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's that's the kind of love we need, friends. We need a sacrificial kind of love. You see, when the hired hand, here he is going to talk about the Pharisees again, sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and he runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his, so the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand, and the sheep don't matter to him. Doesn't that just sound like human beings? But only Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Do you remember before David was the king? And when he stood before Goliath, he says, I'm not afraid of this giant. Because back on my daddy's 40, when I was taking care of my dad's sheep and mine because I'm in the inheritance line, whenever a bear or a lion would come, I'd kill him with a sling. I'd stand up to the wolves because the sheep 
are mine. And Jesus uses this kind of metaphor. He says, I'm not a a hireling like the Pharisees, like the religious leaders. I'm an owner of the sheep. And that's what Jesus did when he laid it all on the line, when he died on a cruel, rugged cross for your sins and for mine. He was laying it all on the line. He was showing us how much he was willing to sacrifice so that we might know his love. You know what my favorite part of the exceptional entrepreneur video was? It's that very end when Betty asked these amazing young adults about the love of God. And they get it. That Jesus loves you right where you are. And I've lived life long enough to know that no human being will really always love me right where I am but Jesus will. There's a love that your heart craves for that Jesus says, follow me and I'll give you my sacrificial love. He wants you to be fully alive. He wants you to know and experience and live in his sacrificial love. And here's the third thing Jesus says. Jesus wants to give me and you the leadership that we crave fully alive, sacrificial love, and now leadership. Look look at verses 14 through 16. Jesus once again says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I give my life up for the sheep. This is that whole sacrifice thing again. But listen to this. I have other sheep that don't belong to this pen. I must lead them too. I want to lead them, and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Jesus says he knows his sheep, and his sheep know him. And then he talks about these other sheep. Who was Jesus talking about? Stay with me. Stay with me. Remember that Jesus is preaching to Jews here. And our Jewish brothers and sisters had read all the way back to Genesis 12 where God said, I want to bless you. And they thought, they said, we are God's chosen people. They just didn't read the rest of the story because Jesus, or because God told them, I want to bless you and make you a blessing to the nations. They were blessed for a purpose. And so when Jesus is talking about other sheep, he's talking about the non-Jews, the Gentiles. He's talking about most of us in this room. And he's saying, I've got other sheep in other places, and I want to lead them too. That's you, and that's me. And so David, remember David, the shepherd king. David, the one who wrote Psalm 23, said, The Lord is my shepherd, and he's going to lead me by green pastures and still waters. Those are the good days. I like it when Jesus leads me there. But he's also the good shepherd who leads us in the valley of the shadow of death and at the table of our enemies. See, a lot of us think Jesus is kind of like a rabbit's foot to put in your pocket. And he just makes life all good and peachy. I've not experienced that. I've experienced that he's the good shepherd in green pasture days, and he's still the good shepherd in Death Valley days. And so Jesus talks to the crowd and he tells them this story, a very different kind of story. And this time the object of the story is him. And Jesus says, I want you to follow me, not these religious rules, because I want to give you life to the fullest, sacrificial love, and I want to lead you. So I close with this story of witness, of following Jesus to his glory. Those of you who've been at Grace Church for a long time know that um, Cheryl and I have two adult sons. And that for the last 10 years, our youngest son, Nathan, has very much struggled with life. He struggled with uh, addictions. And he struggled with mental illness, with depression and anxiety. And it's led our precious little boy to some very, very dark places. And there have been many, many times over the last 10 years that we thought we would lose him. 
the last six months have been a kind of, kind of in-between time for Nate. The last six months, he's been in a place where he's had to decide what the rest of his life is going to be like. And his mom and I, who, of course, love him deeply, we have been trying to follow Jesus and just trust Jesus with our little boy because he will always be our little boy even though he's 26. So it's been hard. Most of the days have been, frankly, valley of the shadow of death days. And yet we know that God is a good shepherd. And so we've been praying for Nathan to get into a place where in his heart and in his mind and in his will, he would choose some honest recovery. So Tuesday, we're getting ready to come home from Orlando for our little trip. Phone rings. And it's Nate to tell us that he had been transferred to the place where he can begin his recovery. So last Tuesday night, Cheryl and I met him, and we got to see him and touch him for the first time in six months. And as we were looking into his beautiful eyes and holding his hand and telling him how much we loved him and how excited we were, what I know is that his mom and I can't fix him, that only Jesus can, because If Nathan will follow Jesus, and I think he really wants to, if Nathan will follow Jesus, Jesus will make our little boy fully alive. And if Nathan will follow Jesus, Jesus will pour his sacrificial love into him. And if Nate will follow Jesus, Jesus says, I'm going to lead you. Green pastures. Valley of the shadow of death. And so Jesus says to you and to me this morning, like he's saying to Nathan and to George and to Cheryl, he's saying, come and follow me. Come and follow me. My friends, will you follow Jesus? Let's stand. So, Lord, we thank you that you're the God who invites us to follow you. I thank you that you want to lead us to not just have a heartbeat, not just have a quantity of life, but a quality of life that is full and overflowing. I thank you that you're the God who wants to be the one who shows us sacrificial love that you literally lay down your life for your sheep, for us. And that you're the God who wants to lead us green pastures and death valley days. Lord, you know that there are so many things that vie for our attention and that call us to follow them. But today we would declare, Lord, we will follow you. We will surrender all to you and follow you. So as we sing this love song to you, Jesus, a song of prayer, a song that simply says, Jesus, we surrender it to you. Would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, come inside of us. Give us that life, that love, that leadership that we desperately crave and desire. Jesus, be our all in all as we worship you now. Your name we pray. Everybody agreeing said, Amen. As we always do, the altar is open, and if you want to come and pray about this or any other need, we invite you to come. If you want somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. I'm going to be over here at the cross, and if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I'd love to pray with you about that or anything else, as a matter of fact. So the altar is open. Let's pray.